Hello, my name is Jimmy Couple, and I live a dual life. By day, I work at MIT, I'm a researcher. I work on program synthesis, programs that write programs. By night, I lead workshops teaching software engineers like yourself how to write better code. Today I'm gonna to talk about something from the intersection of both worlds. Software engineering advice today is confusing. For anything you read online, you'll find someone else arguing the opposite. And today I wanna to ask the question, how do we find a source of truth in software engineering advice? This whole situation reminds me of another source for truth. How do you prevent scurvy? Scurvy is an ancient disease caused by vitamin C deficiency. And after thousands of years of deaths, finally in the 1700s, a British scientist named James Lind proved in an experiment the cure. Eat citrus. And so at the, by the end of the century, the Royal Navy had started requiring all of their sailors to drink lemon juice. So the scurvy rates went from crippling to almost none. But then, in the 19th century, they lost the cure. They didn't understand it well enough. They thought, lemons, why not limes? Big mistake. As a result, there were multiple voyages to the poles as late as 1910, in which everyone got scurvy and people died. Now imagine that you are an 18th century sailor and you ask the powers that be, how can I prevent scurvy? And the answer comes, eat citrus. But wait, lemons, not limes. And wait, do not boil it. And wait, do not store the juice in copper. If you store it in copper, it's worthless. This is kind of starting to sound like witch doctory. Now compare software engineering advice. Well, but first, so before I get there, so from this I coined the term citrus advice. The advice to eat citrus is good advice, it saved people, but it was not precise enough to capture the reality. And so it came with this long list of caveats that made it hard to use. The precise advice is to get vitamin C. And while it took about 200 years to get from citrus to vitamin C, this is the ideal to be aiming for, the simple thing that explains all of the caveats. Now compare software engineering advice. The guru says, discover abstractions to make your code shorter. <laughs> okay, I abstracted my code. No, that is the wrong abstraction. Duplication is better than the wrong abstraction. Well, then how do I know if an abstraction is good design? Well, you see, good design leads to simplicity. Okay, I simplified my API. No, you broke your API. And if you break your API, that creates complexity for other programmers. So this advice, not so easy, it's citrus advice. And I think that if you were to take these four people, three people, uh, these are all close to, but not actual quotes by these people. If you were to show them the same piece of code and ask the same question, you would get similar advice, which goes to show you that they have some deeper intuition about some deeper reality, that these words are not precise enough to capture. So how do we get to more precise engineering advice? Many years ago, I got really into program synthesis. Program synthesis is amazing. It's, you like, it's this program where you just give them stuff, like you tell it what you want to do, on this input it should do this, maybe here's a little bit of information about what the program should look like, and it thinks for a while with its algorithm and it gives you a correct program. It's cool. But a really nice thing is that you cannot be as a synthesizer. You cannot be as a synthesizer and you cannot be as a synthesizer. If you ask a programmer, Hey Bob, if I do this thing, will it make it easier for us to program later on? It can be a pretty vague question, hard to answer. But if you ask, if I do this this way, will it make it easier to synthesize? The algorithm is on paper. You can just look at it, get an answer. And if you want to know, 
if I have this data format of the millions and millions of possible code that I can write, is there anything that's clean? You can just try it, new million examples, get an answer, now. So we're going to look at the parallels between synthesis and human programming. We're going to dive into the different schools of synthesis. Broadly speaking, there are three kinds. Deductive synthesizers, theorem proving, logic, enumerative, searching very cleverly through a large number of programs. Uh, this is how your database optimizes your SQL queries, by the way, enumerative synthesis, and using constraint solvers. In the interest of time, we're mostly gonna talk about deductive today, a little bit about constraint-based, no, no enumerative. But there is a very important fourth school of synthesis. And in fact, we have a few hundred examples of them in, in this room. And that is you. You are a synthesizer. You write programs. And while you might work a little bit differently than these other algorithms, you do not have a constraint solve in your head Although I do think you do work a bit like the deductive synthesizer and do that kind of deductive reasoning, there is only one universe of possible programs, only one universe of possible algorithms for writing programs. And so we can, by looking at these other schools of synthesis, we can learn insights that we can take into our own programming. And that is the thesis of today's talk. And throughout our journey to synthesis land, we will see three common recurring themes of abstractions, constraints, and logic. Enter deductive synthesis. At a high level, deductive synthesis is about taking a high level idea and through a series of mechanical transformations, making it more and more refined and precise until you reach an implementation. Uh, so what is the information a deductive synthesizer works with? Let's look at this. I can, when we talk about software, we can broadly categorize, we're saying at one of three levels. Here's a max function. You can talk about the runtime values. What does it do on this input? Or you can talk about all inputs and look at the code. So runtime is level one, code level two. But this is not capturing the why of the code. It doesn't explain why it works. It does not explain how you came up with it. That information is in the, lo the logic, in the derivation or proof, and I call this level three. As you might guess from the relative size of these boxes, the most information lies in level three, but this is the why. This is the stuff that's only in your head normally. But to a, to a synthesizer, this is just as concrete as the code it outputs at the end. So let's look at it from the synthesizer's perspective. So quick background, here's what a deductive synthesizer looks like. So it has some goal, like I need to get an integer, which is the maximum two other integers. And you write down a logical formula for what that means, or specify it in some way. And so our goal is we're given two integers, and we want a program, such as after running the program, then this condition, it's the max of the two inputs, will be true. It's, to, it's tools. It has a bunch of rules that, that relate a, a piece of code to the abstract logical meaning of the program. And now it can do a search. So you, you want this maximum? OK, let's try getting, running the if rule. Now we know the outer skeleton's an if, and we have two sub goals to prove. And we go into the search, maybe try an if again. Okay, let's try another rule, another rule. Okay, maybe using if there was not a good idea. Maybe let's try an assignment instead. Ah, that works, there's my assignment. Now I know a little bit more about the program. And it just keeps going like this. And eventually it gets the actual program. So that was 40 year old sentences in a nutshell. But you also see this idea in a lot of newer systems. If you're at Nadia's talk an hour ago, you saw her talk about a deductive synthesizer called Synquid. Nadia was a postdoc in, in my lab. The world of synthesis is very small. And here are a couple other systems, lambda squared and, and fiat. All these only do small functional programs because synthesis is very hard, which is why 
instead of actually using this today, I'll tell you to not use it, but instead learn the insights and use it to improve the own algorithms within your head. And by looking at, at things through this lens of deductive synthesis, we can come up with some deeper insights into code. Let's look at specification level notions. I'm writing a web app and I need sanitized strings, no XSS attacks. So to sanitize a string, I escape all single quotes. And now I have two choices for how to use this. Before I save my data to the disk, it must be sanitized. And I can do it either by calling the sanitize function that I just wrote, or by doing it by hand. And take a few seconds to look at these, decide whether you prefer option one or option two. So, so when I've shown this programs before, it's say a, pl a, pl a, pl a plurality prefer option one, a slightly smaller number have no opinion, and a small minority prefer option two. And in a minute, I'll give you a sense in which option one is a correct answer and there's some interpretations. But so how else might you might have come to this conclusion? Well, you might have use the folk engineering advice. And it's like it's more abstract, but the other is more direct. And it's, this one's hard to see happening. It's more to understand. It's easier to change. And when you're working at this level, it's basically like two lawyers in the podium arguing with their side, and both of them have case law to support them. It's, uh, it's hard to get a real right answer. And even if you do, it might not be good enough. So here's an engineer that I used to train. Let's call him Steven and his head is full of citrus advice. And he looks at this and says, option one, it centralizes the code. Good job, Stephen. But his understanding of the information hiding was not deep enough, because five minutes later, I gave him a similar example. So this time, I have my Twitter box, and I type in 139 characters, and it says too long. What? It's because it escaped my string, and it double counted every single quote, because every single quote became two characters. So let's not do that. Let's, let's undouble count the single quotes. And I'm very glad that the Python standard library has this count function. It made this slide easier to write. But I propose instead of doing that, we abstract this counting pre-sanitized string into a function. And Steven looks at this and he says, no. Option one, it's a mistake on the slide, just to say option one, is over engineering. This is premature abstraction, evil. In a moment, we shall see how there is a principle that picks option one in both circumstances. And if you adhere to this principle, then not only is option two dispreferable, it is wrong. And by wrong, I mean compile error level wrong. This comes to the idea of encapsulating ideas. Information hiding is not about private methods and caps and classes, it's about encapsulating ideas. And what the F does that mean? So this is one of those vague things you might have heard before, where once you learn to think like a synthesizer and actually see the logic it's based on, it becomes very precise. And so let's do it. And so through this lens of deduction and deductive synthesis, we're going to see how option one is, is preferable in information hiding, how easy it is to think about and how easy it is to write, and give precise meanings to all three of these lines. And let's begin just by talking about what we mean by sanitized. Well, right now it means that every single quote is escaped. And I can write this down formally in one of many notations. I'm going to use cook because I'm familiar with it. But you can pick any of these others. Maybe you learned one of these earlier today at another session. And it looks like this. It says, I, before every single quote, there's a backslash. And now other modules can use this definition when they're reading about code. But there's something missing here, which is really that definition I gave is sanitized. That's just today's definition. 
and other modules can use it, but what if tomorrow I decide I need to escape other things? I've changed the meaning of being sanitized. Now, all this other code that in the reasoning uses the fact that this is what sanitized means, uh, those are now broken. So what I want is to, is to put all current and future meanings of sanitized behind some abstract predicates. And say, I give you the string, it is sanitized. What do you mean it's sanitized? It's sanitized and that's final. And now this sanitization module can change its mind about what it means by sanitized and no one will ever know. It's a secret. And that is an abstraction barrier. <laughs> do not cross. Now, and you might have seen a diagram like this before. Oh, I centralized my functionality. I wrap it in a function. You can't, you can't get, expose it. This is not like that. This is purely an idea. This sanitized predicate does not correspond to anything in your code. It's just how you think about the code. And on this slide, you'll see exactly how. So in Calk, you write this idea of an opaque predicate, an existential predicate with the opaque keyword. Again, you can do this in about any other formalism. That is, this is the abstraction boundary, but written as code. And now other modules do not get to think about in detail. All they know is, I got a sanitized thing, that, whatever that means, it's a black box. So this is the sense in which option two is wrong. Because in order to look at that code and read it as a human and say, I'm going to justify why this is doing what I want, you have to use somewhere in your head access the information that sanitized strings have single quotes escaped and nothing else escaped. And so what this is actually doing is it's piercing the abstraction barrier, do not cross, and relying on this old piece of information that may change. Dangerous. Whereas in option one, all the information about what sanitized means is encapsulated into the sanitization module. So maybe the sanitized sterlen function, which is right next to sanitized, is allowed to know what it means to be sanitized, but this user code is not. And so thus, it is a secret, secret preserved, it may be changed. And the same view, the sanitized predicates, gives us the answer to the, the first question. So yeah. My sanitized function returns, what does return? It means it returns a sanitized string, whatever that means. And before I save, I have to feed it in a sanitized string, whatever that means. And so when I put these functions together, they line up. But when I try to sanitize it by hand, it's like, you, you gave me a string where you escape all single quotes. I need a sanitized string. I, I don't know that these are the same. What do you mean, that, that is a sanitized string. Oh no, no, you can't use that information. It is opaque, it's hidden. It's behind the abstraction barrier. Do not cross. But that's just an interpretation. There's another way of looking at the program that gives you the opposite conclusion. Suppose the sanitized function is not allowed to know what the sanitized means. I don't know what it returns, but you can't show the sanitized function it doesn't know what that means but this other code does know what sanitized means, then it works when you do it by hand, but not when you call this foreign function, who knows what it does. But of course, there is, there is a third option in which both of them are acceptable. This is the hippie version. There is no abstraction boundary. Everyone gets to know about sanitization, those dirty hippies. And in that case, in both modules, you're allowed to think about the definition of sanitized and see that these line up and do either. Now, when you're actually programming, you don't write down these formal logic things. You don't write preconditions and postconditions in gratuitous detail and everything. No, you have an idea in your head about what you're supposed to do, but it's not given to the compiler. And so, for all three of these interpretations, all three of these worlds, whoever is allowed to know what sanitized means, these all result in the same code. The difference is only at level three in the logic, in the why, not in level two code. But it's, it's still, which one of these worlds you choose as your interpretation 
determines which option is correct and preferable. So is it just a matter of interpretation? Well, there's some pretty clear, like everything's a trade-off, but there's some pretty clear reasons to pick option one. So in option one, I'm all sanitized and I need a sanitized string for save. So I could have sanitized X, I need to show sanitizes X in order to save it, and this proof is trivial. Not only is it trivial, but if I'm programming in Coq, I can actually type in the word trivial period, and it will say, yep, that's a proof. <laughs> and more generally, it can get more complicated when you have aliasing and conditionals, but it's still going to fall within a fragment of first order logic called effectively propositional, or EPR logic. Uh, which is generally pretty easy to reason about. They're fast algorithms. In the other world, I'm doing this replace all thing by hand. I need to show it satisfies some complicated condition about what goes where. And we can do this, but it's a little bit harder. So hard that it was only discovered this year. So, in the first case, when I first write sanitize, I still need to prove that if, when I sanitize a string, it satisfies the, the meaning of being sanitized. And so there I need to think a little bit harder about the sanitize function. But when I actually use it, I can use the fast EPR logic solver. It's easy for me, it's easy for this program to think about. Whereas in the other options, I don't have such a clean module boundary. And so when I call save, with this complicated by hand replace alling, now I need to use the very fancy Chun algorithm and think about strings. And in world one, it's also easier for the synthesizer because if I say, okay, I have a string, now I need a sanitize string, I need to satisfy the sum condition about what goes where, everything's escapes. It's like, okay, look, how can I get a sanitize string? Hmm, is there a way to use replace all? Is there a way to concatenate things? Is there a way to reverse things? It has a lot of options to choose from and try in its search. When you say it is sanitized, what does that mean? You don't, that's on a mean to no basis. Then it is only one option for how to get a sanitized string, which is to call the sanitize function, which exports an interface saying gives you a sanitized string. And so that is the precise meaning of easy to think about and easier to code, synthesis style. So we've explored some correspondences between the deductive schools of synthesis and you. And we've seen the themes of abstraction in the way that we hid, hid, hid sanitize behind the abstraction barrier, do not cross. How this put constraints on the program and what is it possible to write and of course, all this is only seen at the level of logic. Let's look at another example. How is it possible to write a straight line program, no, no indentation, that contains a conditional? Let's find out. I have a program. On the server, it returns 496. Elsewhere, it returns 1024. And my friend Steven sees this code. And he sees that if statement, and he gets mad. Because the internet told him, do not use if statements. Death to the if statements, join the into if campaign. If statements are bad. Mm. So he goes back to his code, and he gets an idea. This is in C. That is on server variable is either zero or one. We can replace this if with an array index. Yeah! Uh, the guru is not pleased. Hmm. You have only moved the conditional into the array. What? So this is, is anti-if advice, a little bit less straightforward than it may have seemed. Let's see what that means. A quick change of notation. I'm going to denote the array 1024496 by saying Start with the empty array. At, at zero, insert 1024. At one, insert 4096. On top of this notation, we have the array axioms. And they, I'm not gonna go into them in detail, but they tell me exactly what it means for 
It, they tell me exactly what it means for, for to index the array. And it gives me this. It says, at one, the, in, the index is 496. Else, let's go deeper to the array. At zero, it's one or two, four. Else, go deeper to the array. Oh, we're out of array, and we're out of axioms, and now it's, so now it's undefined. Um, but really, the only thing you care about is at the bottom right. This simplifies to the formula. If x equals zero, then the index is one or two, four. And if x is one, then the index is four, nine, six. That formula is conditional. If x is this, then it's that. If x is this, then it's that. Now, using this, we can go back to the program and come up with a logical formula to describe what the program does. And we get a conditional. If it's on server, then it's 496, else it's 1024. And we can use other axioms to do the exact same for the original program, and we get the exact same formula. And so there's a sense that both of these have a conditional, the same conditional. And so the synthesizer is only looking at these formulas. And so from its perspective, these two pieces of code are not just semantically equivalent, they were actually structurally identical. We haven't changed it at all. And so conditionals are a semantic notion, not a syntactic notion. Just because you don't write the, the words, the letters IF, does not mean there is no if statement in your code. So the thing that happened here was the array index was a conditional in disguise. Does this mean we should have an anti-array campaign and no array is death the array? No, not every array access is a conditional, but the difference is subtle. And it cannot be purely determined from the code, but is a property of rather of the level three, how you think about it. Let's inspect. Here's another array. It's a list of all the president names. And using that, we can define a president after function. The president after Washington was Adams. The president after Thomas Jefferson was James Madison, and so on. Here's a pretty simple function that does that. It totally breaks on bad inputs, negatives, negatives, the last president. Don't tell me about those. It's a simplified example. And let's talk about what it means to index in this array. And like before, we get a giant conditional. At zero, it's Washington. And at one, it's Adams, and so on. This does not look promising. It looks conditional. But if you already have a notion, an external notion of the ith president, then you can relate this formula to that. And you can get this simpler formula. It's the index of the ith, it's the name of the ith president, which does not involve any branching at all. And now we can use this abstracted formula to think of, look at this code and think about it in a very straightforward manner. I get this index, I get the name of the next president, and I'm done. That's how you would think about it, and that's also how a verifier or synthesizer would think about it, just like I've written down here. There's no case working here, there's no branching, it just works. And so that's a sense in which one array index is a conditional and the other is not. So the difference is that we're able to abstract one and not the other. Maybe you could abstract the size array, find a better way of thinking about it, but I didn't. And because I didn't find such a way, it's, that one's conditional and, and this one is not. So we've again seen this insight from the deductive school of synthesis to the human. And when you see an abstraction and how we abstract the array access, this lets us put extra constraints in a program like death via statement. And, but this only is, can be understood at the level of logic. Let's go to another school of synthesis, the constraint-based. And this section is going to be a little bit different from the previous ones. I said at the beginning that a human and a deductive synthesizer are kind of similar, and so deductive synthesis can shed light on software engineering advice. Whereas the numerator are constraint-based, they're not like a human synthesizer, so they're just going to eliminate the nature of the programs themselves. We're going to be talking about a tool called Sketch, built by my advisor, Armando Solozama. And the Sketch is about programming with holes. It's like, humans are clever, and insightful and slow. Synthesizers are dumb, thorough, and fast. Let's put them together. 
You're gonna write a higher level of the program, the, what the program kind of looks like. The synthesizer is gonna fill in the details. So here's the hello world example. That question marks is a hole. And so this thing is asking, find me an integer question mark such that x times question mark is equivalent to x times x for all, for all inputs. And you might figure out the answer, it's two. And the synthesizer will figure that out too after 0 0.452 seconds. You can do more complicated things like sketch, like if you have a really inefficient linked list reversal, you can get the fast one. You do need a bit more of a complicated hole than an integer, say like some number of statements where a statement looks like this, but it can do it. So I'm going to give you a two minute version of the synthesis, of the synthesis algorithm. It's two parts, constraint solving and the C just loop. So it looks like this. Let's, for simplicity, all integers are two bits. You'll thank me for that in a moment. And we can just say, let's look at the bits of the, the input and the whole and the arithmetic expressions. And all these give us constraints that the bits of the, the digits of the plus expression need to match the corresponding ones in the, in the multiplication expression. So we get a list of constraints on the bits. And now we can also write down bits level formulas for every bit of the plus and the times. And it looks like this, some big Boolean formulas. Thank goodness these are only two bit numbers. And now we'll just solve for what the bits of the whole are. And if you're taking a theory computing course, you might start getting a little scared. Because in a theory computing course, you might have learned that this is the Boolean satisfiability problem. We need to find assignment to these bits so the thing works. That's the SAT problem. Oh no, that's NP hard. And that is a lie. Because it's actually NP easy. And by that I mean that modern SAT solvers can take in millions of variables and solve them very fast, most of the time. In this case, we're lucky enough to be in the most of the time. And so we figure out the bits of the whole and we get the final answer of two. Woohoo, synthesis! But, but really, it's, it makes it easy to think about if you just pick a few inputs at one time instead of all inputs. So on top of this, we built something called the counterexample guide in inductive synthesis loop, CGIS. And it's basically a conversation between two parts, the inductive synthesizer and the verifier. The inductive synthesizer takes some input, takes some tests, gives you a program, the verifier takes in a program and says if it always works, if not, a failing inputs. So does this work? No, it fails this input. Does this work? No, he's a failing test. Does this work? Yes. In other words, CGIS is test-driven development. And from this, I get the idea, maybe you can somehow use Sketch and CGIS to tell us something about testing. So let's do it. What we're going to do is I want to see if my test case is good enough. If it's good enough, if the test passed, my program works. So is there a way to write, write a program that passes all my tests but is the wrong program? Let you use synthesis to find out. So a view of testing is that you have some space of correct programs that you want to find, and every test is going to narrow down the passing programs more and more, hopefully to just the correct ones. But there's something missing from this story. Here's a very simple kind of program, curves on an xy plane. Here are my tests, points, and I want a curve that goes through all three points. Can you guess what curve I have in mind? That's right, it's this guy. <laughs> no, 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 here's another test. Oh, you mean this one? But if we add a structural constraint that the curve must be a line, then those two options go away. And the only option is this line. And not only that, but I need fewer points, fewer test cases. And programs are just generalized polynomials. And program synthesis is just generalized curve fitting. So what does this look like for testing programs? Well, if you have some kind of structural constraint in the programs you can write, then maybe you don't need this third test. Let's put that in action. So I want to synthesize a function to do something very complicated, the length of a linked list. Here are my three test cases on the left. 
And for this, I do. For, for this, I do need to have some kind of oracle that tells me what the correct answer is. And using this, I'm going to synthesize a length function, which passes all the three tasks that I gave it, but there is some input, list question mark, which differs from the correct answer. So pass all the test cases, but it's wrong on somewhere. Let's synthesize. So first, I say it'll have at most three branches. Each conditional looks something like this. For some reason, we'll list operations. Now, here's what things going to happen within each branch. And let's see if it can come up with something. And it does. Sketch produces correct output, not readable output. And so in order to make sure I have the right program, I need to add another test, like list of length three. And now it says, you, if it passes all the tests, there's no way to make it the wrong program. But if I restrict my program a little bit, then I don't need that test anymore. And just with the only three tests, I must have the correct program. So there's all this talk about more coverage, more tests, more precise. But we don't as hear, often hear about writing simpler code, in that the more of one we have, the less the other we need. If we write simpler code, then you don't need as many tests. And, it's a, tr and it's, a ch it's a choice, but I know which end I prefer. Because there's a saying that quality cannot be tested in. Quality must be built in. And this is what it means. So we've gotten some insights into how writing programs, writing tests, from the School of Constraint-Based Synthesis. And again, we've seen abstraction in our use of this test oracle, constraints and how we restrict the program space to make it work, and we use, and the synthesis algorithm itself is based on logic. So we've seen a lot of stuff today. Gone, you, you learned the high level of two different synthesis algorithms, yeah. Seen a lot of stuff you probably haven't seen before, but really what we're doing is reaching that black box in your head of how we write programs and kind of opening up a bit and seeing how it works. And, and in doing so, we can start to stop accepting the vague answers for what we should be doing. You know, start to accept, maybe we can think a little bit deeper about what's going on. What is it possible for me to write right now? Programs are in the wild west, not anything goes. There's a structure to what it's possible to write. And we're accepting that we can find it. So, so my hope is that by coming here today, you're, you're joining me all, you're all joining me on a journey to get away from the citrus advice we become used to. Start to learn how to see the vitamins in our code. Because the first step, the most important step you've already done to get to more precise functionary advice, the big step is simply to believe that it's possible because you are a program synthesizer. So, I have some qu so if you want to see more about this, check out my blog. I love this stuff. I also teach it. I have a web course starting in two weeks. We have one of my former students sitting right there. Uh, I'd like to thank all the people who made this possible, the people who invented what I talked about, as well as the organizers. But most importantly, St. Louis is my hometown, and so we have a very special guest, Yanis, today. I'd like to thank my father for never telling me that I'm crazy, even when he thought it. Remember, you are, you are a program synthesizer. And do not cross the streams, and do not cross the abstraction boundary. OK? So one minute for questions, but I'll stay as long as I have askers. So let's wait for this to load. While it's loading, I'll take a hand. Oh, it loaded. Let's see, I do not see any questions. Okay. Well, if there are no questions, it is great to see you all today, and I hope you had a great strange loop. <laughs>